Any questions from last week that we cover? We've got a lot of our cell wall active agents uh, in terms of antibiotics we're talking about. I don't know you guys are. Yes, ma'am. Always put generic and trade. I like to uh, randomly mix them up so that way it keeps you on your toes a little bit. I'm just kidding. No, no. It'll always be the. <laughs> no, it'll be always generic and then parentheses the brand name. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's some drugs that are so old that like we don't really have a good brand name to put with them anymore. So sometimes if it's missing there, it's just because it's like it's just, we don't have a brand name we okay. normally use for it. So there's always gonna be at least a generic. Yes. Otherwise, it should be a blank answer choice. Okay. That'd be very good. That'd be fun too. Yeah. Hold on. Shh. Say it again. Uh, I'll get that up today. Yeah, um, we'll have a couple of weeks to to work on that. So I wouldn't stress. We haven't even covered all the drugs to discuss yet. Uh, so that's why I figured I had a little bit of time there. Um, the quiz will be next week, though. Uh, that'll probably be between like 10 and 15 questions or so. Um, it's going to be a little more varied in terms of the type of questions because we can kind of play with it in terms of doing like matching. We can do multiple choice. We can do fill in the blank potentially. We'll kind of see how it goes. But it'll be covering over section one and two. So when I finish this PowerPoint today, that'll be the end of that quiz material. Okay. And main the main point with that is just to make sure you're kind of getting the drugs, right? You're kind of starting to make those associations between side effects and drug classes and uh, some of the concepts we talked about there. So it should be straightforward. I, I wouldn't stress too much about it. What do you consider for? Um, fill in the blank. I, actually, well, I mean, it would be you type in the word and be on there. I doubt I'd probably use one of those. More like, there might be some true false on there, though. I'll see how I'm feeling, you know. <laughs> I haven't written it yet, so i gotta, I got to see what kind of mood I'm in, you know. If, if you guys are really nice to me, then, like, I might make it easy. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. I always make it hard, regardless. It'll be fine. Yeah. Someone else have a question? Oh, well, so you said no, build a Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to say. I'll let you guys know. I'll what do you do with spelling how? Um, it will there'll be uh, several options you can, like, fill in there. But, yeah, I would expect spelling. Would be, I wouldn't say, hey, can you please, you know, spell out. What's the weirdest drug we probably hit so far? Like, you know, spell out exactly Piperacil and Tazobactam or something. Like, I, I'm going to be reasonable, right? I'm not going to be some kind of draconian overlord or something to, to punish you. Uh, I'll let the test do that itself. I don't have to worry about doing that. Okay. Okay, any other questions so far? Fantastic. So getting in, we were talking about cell wall active agents. You remember uh, we talked about penicillins and cephalosporins, all those beta-lactame antibiotics. Are those bactericidal or static? Bactericidal, right? Because again, if I open up the bacteria, it's going to lyse out all this contents and the, the cell is dead. Same thing is going to happen here with vancomycin. This is going to be another uh, cell wall active drug. What do you kind of notice about the size of the molecules? It look kind of small. It's pretty big, yeah. It's kind of big and kind of ungainly. That's actually important because it'll have influence on things like tissue penetration, uh, absorption across certain membranes there. And so it's important, even though I put the structures up here, not like you have to memorize them, but sometimes it can kind of link back and, and kind of illustrate some of the concepts <laughs> we're mentioning here. Anyway, vancomycin is a very common antibiotic you're going to use in the hospital. This is um, going to be one of your kind of go-to, you know, patients getting admitted to the floor. I'm not sure what kind of bug they have here. This is going to be very broad coverage from that standpoint, as we'll, as we'll mention here. Um, anyway, so it's not a beta-lactam, but it still works on the cell wall. So if you remember, the beta-lactam antibiotics bound to what enzyme? <laughs> Yeah, penicillin binding protein, right? Makes sense because penicillins are a beta-lactam antibiotic, right? Um, this is different, though. This is actually going to bind to the 2-D alanines. If you remember, the beta-lactam ring looked like those 2-D alanines. This instead binds directly to those and prevents that cross-linking from occurring. So do you think something like beta-lactamase would have any effect on vancomycin? No, because there's no beta-lactam ring for it to, to bind to and, and inhibit, right? Um, so you typically find that vancomycin is, retains a lot of activity, even if you do have some of these more um, resistant sort of strains that may, be, uh, may not work very well for cephalosporins or penicillins or something. Um, however, there still can be resistance. It's still a big problem for some strains of bacteria for vancomycin because you can do things like modify the actual um, the, the amino acids on the end of the chain here. So for instance, here, it turns it from an alanine to a delactate, and then at that point, vancomycin can't do anything with it, and then they can still form those crosslinks, right? So there are ways to overcome this resistance, but ultimately, we're still causing that cell membrane to be uh, disrupted, and you still get that same bactericidal effect, okay?
So anyway, vancomycin is very good, but it's only good at covering gram positives. And so we mentioned that uh, if, uh, if something covers like MRSA or if something covers pseudomonas, those are things you kind of want to make sure you kind of note in terms of very particular antibiotic coverage. This is one of those ones that does cover MRSA. And this is probably the most common one you may be using. There's probably two or three other ones you may be using as well. But one of the most common ones do cover MRSA. And what is MRSA? Psilocin resistant staph aureus, right? So again, very good gram positive coverage. You're going to see that this is also good for if you have a patient who could not receive the penicillin or cephalosporin for whatever reason, and you had to use an alternative. Sometimes vancomycin is used for that. Uh, as an example, sometimes it's get used uh, for surgical prophylaxis if the patient could not receive a cephalosporin due to allergy or some, some other reason here. And so um, MRSA gram positive coverage, very good for that. Uh, interestingly enough, this also covers. Clostridium difficile, right? Your C. diff colitis is a big problem. When do you get C. diff colitis most often? You usually do to other antibiotics being used and you disrupt the normal gut flora unless it's an opportunistic sort of pathogen. Um, this is interesting because vancomycin itself can actually be used to cover C. diff, but only from the oral route. It actually doesn't have any appreciable absorption from the GI tract, so it doesn't cause any systemic side effects when you use it orally. And why do you think that is? We just talked about it a second ago. It's a really big molecule. It can't really cross those membranes very easily. So you can use it orally, get no systemic side effects, and it treats that C. difficile infection. So that's actually in adults now because of resistance to the other gold uh, standard drug of choice, which we'll talk about later. This is now becoming first-line therapy for adult patients with C. diff. So that's actually a really important change that happened maybe over the past year or so. Um, note that you cannot use IV vancomycin for C. diff because it won't really get out into the GI tract where the actual uh, bacteria is. Okay, so one thing to note with that, PO only for that. Most other times you're only going to be seeing IV vancomycin because it just doesn't have very good bioavailability. Okay, um, So this is one of those drugs we're going to use therapeutic drug monitoring on. We really haven't seen that with any of the other antibiotics, uh, mainly because it doesn't really have that narrow therapeutic index like vancomycin does. Um, for those antibiotics, remember we were adjusting for renal function, but you didn't have to do like penicillin levels for a patient, right? This is one of those things that you're going to be doing levels on pretty frequently, mainly because we want to make sure the patient's not accumulating drug and causing toxicity, which we'll mention what that is in a moment, um, but more so that we're looking for the efficacy of the drug. So this is going to be one of those drugs that we're looking for uh, to make sure that we get the certain levels to make sure that we're able to kill those bacteria. So you don't have to memorize the, the dosing or the specific levels we're shooting for, but I want you to know the concepts behind why we're shooting for certain things. So as an example here, you know, this drug is dosed every 8 to 12 hours typically. What does that tell you in terms of it's a concentration or time-dependent antibiotic? It's more time-dependent, right? The more frequently you have to give it, more likely it's a time-dependent antibiotic. So that makes sense. So in this case here, if you were thinking, okay, well, would I want to monitor a peak level or a trough level, which one do you think would be more useful when you're dealing with a time-dependent antibiotic? Trough level. Why is that? Right, because I want to make sure I'm staying above the MIC here, right? So this is a really good point, kind of illustrating that difference between a time-dependent versus concentration-dependent killer here. When you're seeing, for instance, uh, if I was looking at the, the graph of the, the dose versus time, or the concentration versus time, imagine here is the MIC that I'm trying to get above. And let's say, for instance, uh, this is going to be 10 micrograms per ml, right? When I'm dosing the vancomycin, I want to make sure, so I get the first dose here, and I get the second dose here. You notice how I get that kind of stacking effect? I want to make sure that my trough is staying above that level there, right? So presumably as I'm dosing it continuously, I'm gonna see, or as I'm dosing it on a very fixed schedule every eight hours or so, I should be staying above that MIC, okay? If it drops below that, what happens? Yeah, it's not gonna do very good and the bacteria are gonna to start to replicate again, right? So this is why I shoot for trough levels because I wanna make sure it's staying above, the MI, the, staying above that concentration that I need. And again, the MIC you may see being reported as like one milligram per liter, two milligrams per liter. That's gonna be kind of correlated to a serum concentration of like 10 micrograms per ml, right? So kind of correlate that back, back and forth. So anyway, so we keep it above the MIC or above that concentration of uh, presumably as long as we can, and that will kill off the bacteria. Now, note here you can actually have different trough levels that you're shooting for. Why do you think we would need to have different levels? Like one higher than another? What do you think? Yeah, so it was like a really bad infection, right? Or perhaps what if it was in certain areas of the body where it was difficult for a big molecule like vancomycin to penetrate, right? Because when we're measuring a blood level, that doesn't tell us what the tissue level is. So if I have an infection in the brain, 
that doesn't tell me what the brain level of that drug is. So what I'll do if I have a difficult to penetrate tissue like the CNS, like a patient with meningitis, or if I have a patient with pneumonia, the lungs can be hard to penetrate too. I'll shoot for higher blood levels and that will then be a surrogate to say, well, if the level's higher in the blood, then it should be higher in the tissue as well, right? And so that's what we're shooting for there. So meningitis, um, really severe sepsis, uh, you know, uh, you know, pneumonias, this is why we shoot for those higher troughs, okay? That just shows that we're getting higher tissue penetration, should be getting better uh, concentrations to kill off those bacteria, okay? Anyway, um, sometimes we use a loading dose. Why do you think we do that? Yeah, to get to steady state faster, right? If you have a patient who's really, really sick, I don't want to give the, I don't need, I want to give them time to get to steady state, because how long does that take? Four to five half-lives, right? So it takes a little while. And so we're going to look at how we'd actually do the monitoring in terms of when to get those levels there. Um, and in fact, sometimes we actually have staph aureus that get so resistant, though, that we can't even use vancomycin because in order to get the concentrations high enough to kill that, we'd be causing enough toxicity where the, the benefits don't really outweigh the risk. And that's where you have to use backup agents. And we'll talk about what those are in just a little bit. So again, when you're dosing this medication, and see here, this is not a case where they used a uh, loading dose. You're going to notice here, what happens if I check a level, a trough, right before the, the second dose? Hmm? Yeah, it would look, look too low, right? It would look kind of falsely low because I'm not at steady state yet, right? So this is why it's really important that when you're ordering levels, you usually get it before the third or the fourth dose. And by that point, you should be fairly close to steady state. It should give you a pretty good idea of what the trough level is um, for every subsequent dose, assuming the patient's clearance of that does not change, right? And this will undergo renal elimination, as we'll see there. Um, this is really important because in a lot of places, and in fact, I have a PA uh, colleague who works as like a hospitalist overnight, he usually does like a on-call hospitalist kind of position, and his favorite order is vancomycin one gram pharmacy to dose. And he just sends it off and then let someone else deal with it, right? I said, that, that can't be. What, what happens if the pharmacy department decides to, to go on strike? Like, what are you going to do? He's like, I, I'm just not going to give vancomycin then. <laughs> However, so you might be in a lot of organizations where you have the availability of pharmacy to help dose of stuff, but you might be the only person to do that, right? So this is why I make sure we try to illustrate these points, make sure you kind of know what you're doing when dealing with these medications. And this is why I see a lot of practitioners, they'll go ahead and order the vancomycin and they'll get a trough uh, the very next dose. And they need to realize that's not appropriate, right? They have to wait until the drug's actually at steady state. Otherwise, what are you going to do when you get that level back and it looks too low? I'm going to try to increase it, right? And then that's where I run into some problems. So again, you got to wait until you're really at that steady state level. So looking at this, and again, I'm not going to ask you specifically based off of a patient's renal function, how you dose it, but I want you to at least get the concepts here, right? So what do you notice about as the patient's renal function decreases, what happens to the dosing interval? gets longer, right? Because they're not going to be able to clear it as well. So if I have a patient who comes in with relatively good kidneys, I can dose the drug every eight hours. For kids, they have even better clearance. So I have to dose it every six hours in a lot of cases. But as that starts to go down, you're going to get less frequent dosing. And basically the idea is, is you're just giving the body more time to clear that drug so that presumably, even if I have a patient who is getting the drug every eight hours, and then I give the same dose to a patient who uh, uh, has a lower renal function, I'm giving every 24 hours, they should still get the same trough levels, right? It's just the patient with poor kidney function had more time to get rid of that drug. Does that make sense? So we're adjusting the frequency in order to make sure we're getting the same trough levels in order to get the same bacterial antibacterial effect, okay? And sometimes patients' renal functions are so uh, labile, they're so, um, you know, poor and unpredictable that we actually will just sometimes give one-time doses, and then we'll get random levels after that, maybe every 24 hours, and then once they get down into the right range, and then we'll redose it. So sometimes it's every 48 hours, every 36 hours, just depends on the case there. Okay. So why do we care about monitoring uh, the, the levels here? Well, it's because, you know, we, when we want the drug to be efficacious, but also the toxicity can be a problem here. If you're not clearing the drug, you can see that it has ototoxicity, which means what? Yeah, hearing toxicity, right? It actually can damage the hair cells in the cochlea, which can lead to uh, a hearing loss. It can lead to nephrotoxicity, especially when you're using with other medications. It can cause renal issues, which a lot of other antibiotics that you might use along with vancomycin can do, which we'll talk about later. And so we're making sure the patient's not accumulating those levels in order to make them more at risk for these toxicities, okay? Because imagine if you have a patient who is, uh, say, in the ICU and they're sedated and they're getting vancomycin, are they going to be able to tell you that they are not able to hear so well? He's hearing a little fuzzy. No, they can't tell you that, right? So by looking at the levels, we can hopefully prevent those toxicities from occurring in the first place.
other things to note with vancomycin, um, there's this thing that they call red man syndrome that is very kind of prototypical of vancomycin. It's an infusion rate related reaction. I mean, if you run this drug in too fast, the patient's going to get kind of flush all over. They're going to get fevers and chills and they're going to feel miserable. Some people will mistake this to be an allergic reaction, and this is not the case. It's directly related to how fast that drug is going in. And so some people say, well, get the epi out. we got to treat this anaphylaxis. No, you just got to slow it down, right? And a lot of new nurses who may not have run into this before will think, hey, oh, this is bad, when really it's just they gave it too quickly. And so in a lot of cases, places will default to giving it over, say, 60 minutes. Um, we defaulted over at Nemours to be 120 minutes. Most drugs we can give over 15, 30 minutes, no problem. This one, you really got to slow it down. Otherwise, you're going to see this reaction here, okay? Anyway, so we talked about the troughs when we're going to get those, and just be aware of getting random levels are going to be reserved for patients where they have really unstable renal function, and we're just giving them a one-time dose, and then we'll get random levels after that to see when they get down to the appropriate trough level, and then we'll redose it at that point. Okay. But again, what do you have to know when you're, you know, kind of associating a level with a particular dose? What do you need to know? Timing is really important, right? So make sure the documentation from the nurse is appropriate. This is one of those cases there, again, we're going to get a level back for vancomycin. We mentioned a trough level of, say, 10 to 15 is pretty typical. You get a level of, like, 50, and you're like, what happened here? It's because the nurse drew the level. It was supposed to be a trough level, but then they gave the drug, and then they got a level right after. So now that really it's a peak level, right? So, again, be careful with these things here and try to make rational interpretations of these levels. Okay, here's an example of what red man syndrome looks like. And again, if you didn't know any better, it could look like an allergic reaction, right? Um, so again, typically just slowing down the infusion is all you need to do to treat that. And in fact, vancomycin, a lot of these re reactions were related to the impurities in the product, and they used to call vancomycin Mississippi mud, which is kind of an interesting historical fact. And if you look here, you can imagine why they call it that. Normally, IV products are like nice and clear, they're white, and you, know, you don't really, you know, it doesn't look like you're injecting mud into your veins. It's usually not something we want to do to our patients here. Um, the, the most uh, probably sketchy looking drug I ever gave to a patient um, was a patient who got bitten by a cobra. It was actually a, an African cobra. Uh, and we had to go to the zoo to get the antivenom for that because they always have to carry antivenom for the snakes they have. And it came back and it was this like African product and it was um, basically had like a cork stopper in it. And we we're just like, uh, this is not FDA approved whatsoever. So we made sure we signed like 40,000 consents with the patient saying, you know, this is this is not uh, FDA approved and you're okay to get this. And he said, yeah, just give it to me. And so we gave it to him and everything turned out fine. But still, you never know when you're going to eat sketchy drug products. Anywho, also don't play with African cobras and don't get bitten and you're fine. You don't have to worry about it. Anyway, so those are the cell wall active drugs you're mentioning there. So moving on, now we're going to talk about our protein synthesis inhibitors, okay? So basically what this, these are going to do is that when you have transcription of DNA, you form RNA, right? RNA is then going to go over into the ribosomes and then produce new proteins, right? You have the transfer RNA that brings in new amino acids, and then you have that chain elongation. Well, if you inhibit the ribosomes from doing their thing, what happens to protein production? It stops, right? So this is one of those cases here where it's not necessarily a bactericidal effect. It's more of a bacteriostatic effect because by stopping protein production, it doesn't immediately kill off the cell, but eventually it can lead to that. And also it will stop mitosis from occurring uh, because the cell can't produce the nice proteins to, to double itself essentially. And the reason why we can use uh, these antibiotics is here is because um, we have different ribosomes than what the bacteria do. And I'm not going to get so granular with the numbers here, but just know that there is a difference. Um, however, if you have high enough concentrations, there can be effects where it can affect our cells as well, which can lead to some of the toxicities we're going to see there. Anyway, um, I don't really care that you know if it works on the 50S or the 30S ribosomes. Just know if it's a protein synthesis inhibitor, know that's the mechanism, okay, for these different classes of drugs. And we're going to get into these more specifically as we move forward. So first off, I want to talk about the macrolides. This is a very popular group of antibiotics. Most people have probably heard of a Z-Pak or have possibly been on a Z-Pak before. Um, this is where this is going to, uh, this is the category it falls into. Um, the three drugs that fall into this category, uh, some people use the mnemonic ACE to remember that, but it's azithromycin, clarithromycin, and erythromycin. Erythromycin is probably the oldest one of the category, and then Azithra is probably more of the newer one. But um, we'll see them used in a, in a host of different cases here, most either IV, PO. Um, but erythromycin you see used topically. There's eye ointments. There's uh, acne products. You know, there's a lot of different products out there um, for, for erythromycin. And so um, in terms of coverage, these are really going to be the first antibiotics we've seen so far that cover atypical 
pathogens, right? So things like mycoplasma is going to be covered by our macrolide antibiotics. Also, they do like to cover a lot of those upper respiratory bugs like strep pneumo and ancient influenza and things like that, which is why you frequently see zithromycin being used for a lot of upper respiratory and uh, like things like community-acquired pneumonia, sort of respiratory infections, right? So it's good gram positive coverage here, good gram negative coverage, not really any anaerobes. You really won't see a lot of like macrolides being used for like gut infection potentially, but the atypical bugs is really where you get a lot of utility out of these. So Legionella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia, all those get really good coverage from the macrolides, okay? So where do we use them? As I mentioned, you know, things like community-acquired pneumonias, skin soft tissue infections. And sometimes we'll actually use this for um, patients who may be immunocompromised and at risk for certain bacteria that most other healthy patients won't. And so mycobacterium avium complex is one you may see being used for patients who have uh, AIDS. And you're actually using this as a prophylaxis before they get the infection and then sometimes for actual treatment when they do have the infection there. Um, chlamydia is a, another big one. And then H. pylori. Where does the H. pylori show up? In the stomach, yeah, what does it cause? Yeah, peptic ulcers, right? You guys ever heard the story of how they discovered that? Did I talk about that story? Yeah, basically drank the, the, the H. pylori because no one believed him. They thought it was bacterial uh, bacteria that was causing these peptic ulcers. So he drank a vial of the stuff, gave himself an ulcer, and then drank antibiotics, and then it fixed it. Got him getting a Nobel Prize for that. So I recommend looking at There's some good YouTube videos talking with the guy. Um, huh? Uh, not at the time, no, but since then we've, we've, we've figured out that actually, yeah, he, he was onto something, but uh, not the most uh, well-designed study, I would say, if the N of 1 and you're the end, not usually how we do, do things. But you'll see this is a common component of that, either clorthromycin, sometimes azithro can be used there for H, H pylori. And again, we'll talk about these specific uh, use cases when we get to those uh, when those actual organ systems. So we'll talk more about pneumonias when we get to uh, pulmonology. We'll talk more about H. pylori when we get to GI. So this stuff I don't want you to spend as much time memorizing, but the general coverage is what I want you to think about, okay? Now, the adverse effects, this is an important one because we mentioned most antibiotics will cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea for sure, but the GI effects tend to be a little bit worse than the macrolides, and that's because they can interact with something called the motilin receptor. And so this is something that will increase peristalsis and cause things like abdominal cramping, diarrhea. And actually, we can use that for our own therapeutic purposes. I have a lot of patients over at the children's hospital taking erythromycin. It's not because they have an infection. It's because they have disrupted motility for some reason or another. And the GI docs want to go ahead and, and prescribe erythromycin erythromycin to help stimulate that motility and help them to, to be able to, you know, have normal defecations, absorb things appropriately, all of that. So sometimes you'll see that being used for non-infectious purposes here, okay? Occasionally, you can see some cholestatic hepatitis, pretty rare for the most part. And then with patients who have renal insufficiency, they can't clear the drugs. Or if they get really big IV doses, sometimes they can get this transient hearing loss, which is pretty problematic. Um, the other big thing I really want to focus on, though, is QT prolongation. That should be another one of those kind of buzzwords you hear when we talk about medications of things you want to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so when I say QT prolongation, anyone know what that means? <laughs> It has to do with the heart rhythm, has to do with the repolarization of the ventricles. I'll show you some graphs here in a second. Um, now, you guys have covered the cardiac conduction cycle at all. We'll get to that. We'll talk much more about that in cardio later on in this class. Um, but I'll cover it briefly here, and then it'll, it'll make more sense when we get talking about the antiarrhythmics and whatnot. Um, the big takeaway, though, is that typically these drugs that prolong QT are generally not a problem by themselves. It's when you combine multiple drugs that all do the same thing is when it becomes problematic. Or if you have a patient who just naturally has a prolonged QT, some of those cases are not yet diagnosed because oftentimes they may not present unless they have like a syncopal event or something that indicates they might have an arrhythmia. But these are things that you want to think about. Basically what happens is, is these medications block the efflux of potassium out of the cardiac cells. Okay, And basically what you're finding, if you were to look at a normal EKG strip, you know that the QRS is typically indicative of what's happening in the heart. Yeah, so it's the depolarization of the ventricles, right? And then the T wave is what? Yeah, it's a repolarization, right? So again, the heart, the ventricles are resetting themselves, getting them ready for the next heartbeat to come along, right? So what happens here is by blocking the efflux of potassium, potassium is really important. When it leaves the cell, it causes this repolarization to actually occur here normally, right? Well, if I block that, I slow the whole thing down, and you get this elongation of that repolarization phase, okay? Now, again, as I mentioned, if it's a few milliseconds, it's not going to be a big deal for your patients. But as it starts to get longer and longer and longer, you predispose yourself to having these kind of range and arrhythmias hit, and you get a very particular arrhythmia that happens because of this. And so you can see what this elongation looks like. You notice the T wave gets kind of elongated, thus that it prolongs the QT interval there, okay? And then 
oftentimes when you're reading EKG, you're not looking at the QT specifically, but the QTC, that's the corrected QT based off of the heart rate for the patient there. And you can do the calculations yourselves. I'm sure you might get into that in, in other classes. But for my purposes here, that is evidenced by a prolonged QTC interval. What that does, it can potentially lead you to having a certain arrhythmia, and that is called, anyone know? Torsades de points, or torsades de points. I suppose, if you're French, who knows? That's probably a bad pronunciation. But anyway, the main thing is that it means twisting of the points. And so you get this very particular arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia. Um, and does that look compatible with life? Generally, no, right? So you get this twisting of the points here. And it's very, if you see, it's very dramatic. And so it's, uh, it's pretty cool when you actually get to see it. And then uh, the treatment of choice for this is actually going to be IV magnesium sulfates. It's a little good thing to remember in the back of your mind. You're like, wow, your professors when you know that later on. Um, but yeah, IV magnesium sulfate is going to be the treatment of choice for torsades. Okay, good board style question too for you guys. Anyway, other things to note with the macrolides is that they can cause some SIP interactions. And so this is the big one to also think about is that these will inhibit SIP3A4. This is going to be worse with erythromycin and least with azithromycin, but it's still going to be of concern. So by inhibiting CYP3A4, it's going to cause levels of drugs that get metabolized by that enzyme to do what? Go up, down. They're going to increase, right? Because we're inhibiting that CYP enzyme. So 3A4, remember, that's a really important one because it metabolizes all these different drugs. Those levels are going to go up, and thus you can see toxicity from those medications, okay? So be very careful whenever you're adding this onto a regimen. The patient's on no other meds. It's not a big deal, but they have a pretty extensive med list. This is something you want to consult. Make sure you're running those interaction checkers beforehand, okay? Okay. So moving on to other protein synthesis inhibitors. Next, we have the tetracyclines. Anyone know why we call them tetracyclines? They have four lower rings there, absolutely, right? So we have tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline that fall into this category here. And so these are also blocking protein synthesis. Again, I don't care that you know specifically what ribosome. I'm not going to ask that on a test. Just know that it's a going to be a protein synthesis inhibitor. Also know that because of this bacteria is static. And with these ones in particular, they are very, very broad spectrum in terms of the, the number of bacteria they're going to cover here. They really have green down the board here in terms of having good anaerobic coverage. They're good for gram negatives, good for gram positives. If you know here, they're good against MRSA. So this is another group of drugs you could potentially be used against MRSA. It's good to think about. Um, also things like H. pylori could be useful here. T. pallidum, anyone know what that causes? Treponema pallidum. We've got syphilis. Yep, so it can sometimes be used for certain uh, sexually transmitted infections. We'll have a whole section on that later on. Um, also, really good for animal-borne diseases. So things like Yersinia pestis. Anyone know what that causes? Black yeah, the black clay, the bubonic clay, right? So uh, in case you've seen like, any rats in the corner or something like that, you may want some doxycycline in order to, to treat that, right? So a lot of different utilities here for the tetracyclines. Um, we use it very frequently for acne, either orally or topically, potentially. A lot of atypical pneumonias can be covered by the, the tetracyclines. Uh, things like Lyme disease, chlamydia, a lot of different things we use this for. However, some side effects and things to note with these agents here. In terms of drug interactions, this will chelate with cations. I say chelation, what does that mean? This means it's going to bind up to something else, right? So if I am taking, say, my tetracycline along with, say, I'm drinking with a glass of milk, that calcium can bind to that and prevent it from being absorbed. Or if I'm taking with the multivitamin that has iron in it, that can bind to it and prevent it from being absorbed, okay? So you've got to be really careful to make sure you're separating these out to where you don't have that interaction occurring there, okay? Now, it likes to bind to calcium. It does the same thing in the body, too. And so because of that, you can actually see discoloration of the teeth. Is actually where if you were giving it to kids for, say, over a couple of weeks or so, and they're less than eight, when their adult teeth come in, that can actually stain the teeth permanently, something to note. It can also affect the bones as well, because, right, where do, the, where do we keep a lot of our calcium? In the bones, right? So combined to that as well, and that can lead to depression, skeletal muscle, uh, skeletal growth, and so that's why you want to make sure um, that you don't give this to pregnant patients in the second and third trimester, because it can actually stunt that growth there. Photosensitivity is another big thing, especially here in Florida. Some exposed areas are going to be more likely to see a lot of um, rashes and blistering and things like that, so make sure to cover up or use like a physical sunblock to help prevent that. Okay, And they have to be renally dose-adjusted, like most of the other drugs we've been looking at so far. Uh, one kind of similar to this in the same category is tigacycline. Anyone know why they called it tigacycline? Actually, it looks like a little tiger. has like a little tail on the end of it there. That's what I think. And actually, they pushed a lot of that in the marketing. Uh, you'll see here in a second. But um, basically, this is an IV tetracycline sort of like agent um, that has pretty broad coverage here. And you're going to see that it's useful for a lot of different sort of 
kind of resistant infections. So if I have a patient who's developing an infection, um, say for instance, uh, really nasty gram negative, it's, it's kind of getting resistant to some of my beta lactams. This is something I might use uh, as an alternative in some cases there. So it's good for skin infections, good for intra-abdominal infections because it will hit anaerobes and a lot of gram negatives. But just note that it's not going to get uh, MRSA. It's not going to cover more resistant things like VRE. Anyone know what that stands for? Enterococcus, yeah, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. If you develop that, we have to look for other agents to treat that. But it does have pretty broad coverage there. And again, I just like the marketing a whole lot because imagine like if you're a, the provider and you get to walk around with a tiger at your side, like no one's gonna say anything to you. Whatever you say goes because you got your tiger with you, right? Anyway, but it is bright orange, which is kind of another kind of interesting thing there. So if you ever see like an orange IV bag hanging on a patient, that, that's probably what it is: is a patient in tiger cycling. Otherwise, nothing really special to, to note with those similar monitoring parameters as you see with the other tetracyclines. Okay, up next we have our aminoglycosides. There's three main drugs that fit into this category of amikacin, gentamicin, and tobramycin. These are also notable because these are very frequently uh, undergo therapeutic drug monitoring, kind of similar to what we did with vancomycin. Okay, And very frequently, aminoglycosides are given along with vancomycin if you need really kind of broad spectrum coverage and you don't really know what the patient might be infected with. So very often we'll have patients who come in, uh, say from a nursing home or some other healthcare sort of environment, and they have pneumonia or they have sepsis, right? They, um, they have an infection somewhere, we may not know where it is, and so we want to go really broad and make sure we cover as many things as we can. So two bugs you always want to cover in those kind of situations is any two bugs we've kind of talked about a lot about? MRSA and pseudomonas, right? So very typically, you're going to find they'll have vancomycin on for MRSA coverage, and then they'll have two drugs to cover pseudomonas. Because pseudomonas is so uh, concerning in terms of resistance and, and just how nasty of a bug it is, we'll often have to double cover for that one in particular. And so again, we mentioned using double coverage, not, oftentimes not really recommended, but in this case it is. Um, we want to use two different mechanisms here, right? So in this case here, we could use something like an aminoglycoside, that works on protein synthesis, and then what else could we use? What else uh, have we talked about that covers pseudomonas? Hmm? Yeah, cefepime. Like so, like cefepime would be a good one to cover that, right? Uh, Piperacillin, tazobactam, right? Most of your carbapenems. So again, that makes sense to use those two different categories together because they have two different mechanisms, right? One's working on the cell wall, one's working on protein synthesis. That is a good complementary set of mechanisms. You wouldn't want to use gentamicin and tobramycin because they're doing the same thing. You wouldn't really get much benefit out of that. Okay. So again, think about that synergy you can get by using different mechanisms. So mean glycosides, kind of similar to vancomycin in the fact that where vancomycin only got gram positives, you mean glycosides only get gram negatives. And this is kind of similar to that um, uh, estreanam we talked about, that monobactam, um, in terms of its coverage there. So really good for pseudomonas. It's going to get most of your interbacteriaceae. Um, you know, occasionally, the one thing we might use it in terms of gram positive coverage is for enterococcus, but that's only if we're using it along with another drug for synergy. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about endocarditis a little bit later on in the cardiac section there. However, this is actually one of the, the first drugs we're kind of talking about now that is uh, very typically um, used for its concentration-dependent killing effects. And so we mentioned that most of the protein synthesis inhibitors are going to be bacteriostatic. This one's actually bactericidal. I can't give you a good reason why that is, but I just know that it is, right? And so before, we used to dose every eight hours, and that was fine and all, but we finally realized that by giving it every 24 hours, we can give a really big dose all at once, get a really high peak concentration, and then even though the levels drop down really low we still get that post-antibiotic effect, right? So now we give it every 24 hours. And what do you think is the additional benefit of giving the body 24 hours to get rid of that drug instead of, say, eight hours? Less toxicity, right? So that's the really big thing we like with that. It's the fact we give it less frequently. We're still getting the same good antibiotic effect, but guess what? Less toxicity we see with it, okay? So very good from that standpoint. Anyway, we use this a lot for sepsis, febron neutropenia, and, and then occasionally on that intercoccal synergy there. Um, but the big dosing considerations are as well are the renal toxicity you can cause here and the ototoxicity that can be seen when you have accumulation of the drug. And again, what do we see else that cause the same thing? Vancomycin, right? And again, very frequently they're given together, so it's sometimes hard to tell which one could have been the causative agent there, right? And occasionally you can't necessarily stop either one of those. You may not have a good alternative to switch to, depending on the situation. But again, renally adjusted, you really got to watch that renal function, make sure that things are uh, getting cleared appropriately. Um, and so when you're monitoring renal function, what are two things you can really look at to determine how it's going for your patient? So, so serum creatinine and thus your creatinine clearance, right? When you calculate that, what else? BUN, not quite as useful. Well, GFR is kind of being calculated from your creatinine clearance. It's kind of like a surrogate for that. 
urine output, 100% right. And again, remember that you can usually detect changes in urine output much quicker than you can changes in creatinine clearance. So it takes time for creatinine to get to a new steady state, whereas urine output, I can tell if the patient stops peeing all of a sudden, right? So you can actually monitor that, and that's why it's important if you have uh, eyes and nose ordered, the nurses follow that and get really good, um, uh, you know, uh, monitoring for that. Anywho, and normally when we're monitoring for levels of here, if we're doing Q24-hour dosing for the aminoglycosides, when we're measuring our levels, um, we don't really care about a peak level because we know we're given such a big dose that they're going to get a good peak level. The thing, though, we do monitor is for the trough. And so in this case, why do I measure the trough? Hmm? Well, remember, it's concentration-dependent killer, so I don't have to worry about the MIC and staying above it. Notice here I'm looking for levels less than one, less than five. What am I looking for? I want to make sure they're getting rid of the drug, right? I want to make sure that it's basically undetectable before the next dose. And if they're holding on to some drug, that shows me that they're not clearing it well enough. I may need to extend out that interval, right? So I may need to go maybe every 36 hours in some cases, maybe every 48, depending on the situation. So that's why um, we will frequently monitor for troughs in those situations and make sure they're clearing it. Again, that's a different reason than what I was looking at it for vancomycin, where I want to make sure it's actually being efficacious, okay? So kind of keep those two different situations in mind there, okay? Okay. Uh, up next, we have uh, Zyvox, or linazolid is the generic here. So this is going to be another protein synthesis inhibitor. And this one is really good for uh, resistant gram positives. This is only going to cover gram positives, but we like to reserve it and hold on to it in cases where things like vancomycin may not be appropriate. So if you have like a VRE that develops here, uh, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, this is a really good agent for that. Um, if you have MRSA where the patient maybe can't receive vancomycin, maybe due to really poor renal function or really erratic renal function, this is going to be a really good drug to jump to there. And so you can use it for a lot of hospital-acquired, community-acquired MRSA pneumonias uh, in a lot of cases. Things to note here, um, can cause thrombocytopenias. You may want to watch for things like bleeding for these patients here. And then the other thing would be uh, this interaction with SSRIs. Anyone know what SSRI is? Serotonin, selective serotonin, serotonin reuptake. reuptake inhibitor. Yeah, yeah. What do we use it for? Anxiety, depression, yeah, yeah. So we use it for a lot of uh, a lot of psych indications. Um, so one of the things you're going to learn, we'll hit on this much more in the psych section coming up. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, great. Um, you, you can teach a class if you like. If you have all the answers, I'm more than happy for someone else to take over. I'm just kidding. Um, Anywho, so there is an enzyme that normally metabolizes a lot of the catecholamines our body produces. So when I say catecholamines, anyone know what I'm referring to? Catecholamines is generally referring to they kind of a similar structure, but things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, they all kind of share similar biologic precursors, okay? And one of the enzymes that is responsible for metabolizing those structures is going to be monoamine oxidase, okay? Monoamine oxidase will metabolize things like serotonin and whatnot. Um, and in fact, that's how we used to treat depression way back in the days. We would give a drug that could inhibit that enzyme, and you'd have natural buildup of levels of serotonin, and thus mood improved, Okay. We'll get more to that mechanism later on. The problem, though, is that when you mix multiple drugs together that can increase serotonin levels, you can r run your risk for developing what they call serotonin syndrome or serotonergic toxicity, and that's no good. You can see the things like hyperthermia, hypertension, ultramental status. Again, we'll talk much more about that later on, but just know that Zyvox, even though it works really good as a gram-positive antibiotic, um, it actually can also inhibit the monoamine oxidase enzyme. So you can see some interactions there, um, especially if you mix it with um, patients who are also can, eating foods like high in tyramine, which is a precursor to turning into serotonin. That's an interaction you want to watch out for. Okay. Um, ideally, what you would do is actually give the patient like two weeks of washout away from their antidepressants and then put them on Zyvox, but oftentimes we don't have that option, and so we have to give them concurrently in some cases there, um, and you have to just monitor for that toxicity. So again, just keep it in mind, this is a reaction you can see. We'll talk much more about that in the psych section later on, okay? So just know this is going to inhibit monoamine oxidase. You'll see buildup of levels of serotonin. By itself, it's not a problem. When you mix it with other serotonergic drugs, that's where it becomes an issue, okay? Anywho, um, you guys look like you all could use a big boost of serotonin right now anyway. A little down in the dumps. Um, anywho, so when we're, again, yes, ma'am. Monoamine oxidase, MAO. So if you ever hear of like an MAOI, those are like the old school drugs we used to use for depression. Um, and they did basically the same thing that Zyvox is doing in that case there. 
Um, anyway, so again, as I mentioned, Zyvox are really good for vancomycin resistant enterococcus or vancomycin resistant staph aureus. You can use it for that. And again, covers gram positives only. It's only use case for it. The nice thing about this, though, is remember we had to do all this therapeutic drug monitoring with vancomycin. You don't have to do that with Zyvox. You just give it 600 milligrams, either IV or PO every 12 hours. The dosing is super easy. And it makes a lot of practitioners want to use it, but we try to hold on to it because once we lose Zyvox, we may not have a whole lot of other options to go to in terms of resistant gram positives. In alternative, something else you can use for vancomycin resistant enterococcus or um, patient who could not receive vancomycin is a drug called daptomycin or cubicin. And so this one's really interesting because it actually causes this, this uh, bacterial depolarization. It basically kind of shocks the bacteria to where it disrupts its DNA and RNA and all these kind of things. And it basically will kill the bacteria because of that. Um, and so it's really good for like skin and soft tissue infections or bacteremias. However, we can't use it for pneumonias. This is one notable case where we cannot use it for pneumonia. And it's actually because the surfactant in the lungs will disrupt the drug and, and make it uh, useless, essentially. Other things you want to look out for in terms of monitoring for adaptomycin is actually looking for things like myalgias and muscle pains, and then uh, monitor for CPK levels. Anyone know what CPK stands for? Someone usually usually says California Pizza Kitchen, which is not what we're referring to here, but it's uh, creatine phosphokinase, and that it can be if you're spilling that out of the muscle, it usually is indicative of muscle breakdown, and so if, uh, it could lead to things like rhabdomyolysis potentially, but it's a thing we would monitor for. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we have our fluoroquinolones. This is coming another big category here. Um, these are going to include things like levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, moxifloxacin. We'll have other ones we'll talk about, like in the ENT section, a little bit later on. Um, these are going to be another set of bactericidal antibiotics, where basically their mechanism here, this is different than some of the other protein synthesis inhibitors we're looking at. This one actually works on the enzyme called topoisomerase. And what toposomerase does is normally when you have uh, DNA all wound up in a superhelical form, um, there's not a lot of room for things like DNA polymerase and whatnot to actually get in there and interact with the DNA. So what do you do? Well, you got to unwind that DNA, kind of loosen it up a little bit to allow for enzymes to come in, transcribe things, do whatever it needs to do. By inhibiting this enzyme, you basically cause all these single strand breaks to occur within the DNA itself, right? So the basic thing can't unwind and rewind itself like it normally does. And so by causing all these strand breaks, what happens to the DNA, do you think? Hmm? Yeah, it can't go back together. It gets more and more damaged. And eventually, what does the cell do when it realizes all this DNA is damaged? It just pushes the escape button and says, apoptosis, we're out of here. We're done so, right? So basically, that's what it does. It causes enough DNA damage to eventually trigger apoptosis to get rid of that bacterial cell, right? So... The fluoroquinolones, very nice uh, in terms of coverage, very broad. They're going to get uh, a lot of coverage in terms of like atypicals, gram negatives, some gram positives. And you're going to see here, and we'll, we'll kind of go over the, the stoplight metaphor here and the individual agents in a second. But you see them used all the time for a lot of indications here. In fact, they frequently get overused, and that's why resistance is a really huge problem with the fluoroquinolones specifically. Um, almost to the point where like a Z-Pack gets overused all the time. Fluoroquinolones like Levaquin also get overused quite frequently for a lot of upper respiratory tract stuff. Um, um, note here, you can use them for UTIs, but not moxifloxacin. That's one notable exception here, because most of them get renally eliminated. Moxie is going to be one of the cases where they, it gets more uh, liver metabolized. And because of that, it doesn't ever make it down into the urinary tract system to actually work and actually treat that infection there. So that's one notable exception in terms of coverage. Okay. Anyway, um, interactions. So this will have some similar interactions we've seen previously with other classes. So for instance, it will bind with antacids and iron and calcium and things like that in the GI tract. So you got to be careful for those interactions there. It will also prolong the QTC interval. So you want to be careful with that. And again, as I mentioned, multiple drugs all added together is when you can really see some big problems with that. You know what a normal QTC is? It's around 440 milliseconds. It's a little bit longer for females, 450 milliseconds. But it really run into problems with torsades when you think about getting above the 500s, close to 600. That's when you really run into some big issues there. Anywho, with um, elderly patients, you can see some CNS effects. You can see like dizziness, ultra mental status. Um, and again, it's really tough with elderly patients because oftentimes um, infections themselves can cause pretty big change in their mental status as well. Or is it their dementia is getting worse? Or is it because they're in the hospital and now they're sundowning? So oftentimes it's difficult to discern what's the actual cause of their mental status changes, but it could be related to the medications we're giving them specifically. Okay. Um, other things would be like a warfarin interaction. I mentioned warfarin does what? Remember? Mm -hmm. 
that's an anticoagulant, right? It's a vitamin K antagonist. Well, not only will this disrupt some of the gut flora and prevent vitamin K from being absorbed, uh, but it also can have some, some minor SIP enzyme inhibition where it can actually cause levels of warfarin to increase, thus increasing your risk for what? Bleeding. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of overuse, so a lot of resistance with the fluoroquinolones, and in fact, they very frequently um, are, are not useful for a lot of like you know things like strep pneumo nowadays, just because the resistance is getting so uh, overdone in some areas. Um, not only that, we're also seeing a lot of collateral damage in terms of things like C. difficile becoming uh, more common with this one, right? Because again, you disrupt that gut flora, you're going to see C. diff pop up in, in some cases. So getting into specific agents here. So oh, yes, sir. Can you go back? Yeah. Um, so normally warfarin works as an anticoagulant by inhibiting the production of clotting factors in the liver. So specifically um, things like two, which is thrombin, uh, seven, nine, and ten. Those are the main ones that it inhibits, and it does so by inhibiting the recycling of vitamin K. So a big source of the vitamin K that we get in, uh, through the GI tract is actually coming from the bacteria that live there normally. So not only do antibiotics kill off those bacteria and can lead to less vitamin K being absorbed, which makes warfarin work better. So you can see less clotting factors being produced and less more bleeding risk. Not only that, but then fluoroquinolones also have some CYP1A2 inhibition, which is a minor uh, uh, pathway for warfarin. And so that also increases warfarin levels to make it work better as well. That makes sense. So anyway, with ciprofloxacin, it's kind of considered sort of a second generation fluoroquinolone here. Um, the first generation agent we are not really using systemically. It's ofloxacin. We'll talk more about that in the ENT section a little bit later on. Um, but here you're going to find um, that it has really good gram negative and atypical coverage, kind of spotty in terms of pseudomonal coverage. So not necessarily great on that standpoint there. Um, and again, you're going to find that the renal dosing considerations are really important. you got to monitor for this, especially in those elderly patients who are more at risk for things like the, the CNS effects with this. Now, levoquin or levofloxacin is, is another very, very common fluoroquinolone you're going to run into. And again, good, uh, similar coverage to what you see with the second generation Cipro, but you're going to see increased pseudomonal coverage. So this is very frequently used for uh, pneumonias, where if you think there might be pseudomonas there, it would be common to see, say, for instance, levoquin plus zosin, or you could do, um, say, levoquin plus gentamicin. Those are common combinations you would see to double cover for that pseudomonas, right? Um, and again, when it's used for a lot of these community-acquired issues, this is where you run into a lot of that resistance that pops up over time there. Okay. And the Moxie is still considered a third generation. This one actually doesn't have any appreciable pseudomonal coverage, so this one I would not want to use uh, if I suspected my patient had uh, pseudomonas, uh, especially in the urine, because, again, this one cannot be used for UTIs because it doesn't, it doesn't go uh, under renal elimination. Okay. But it would be beneficial if you're using it for, say, pneumonia and you had a patient with unstable renal function. You don't have to adjust for that. So it could be a benefit in some cases. Okay. So as I mentioned, a lot of the side effects of the fluoroquinolones, you can't see some photosensitivity. There could be some SIP interactions to this inhibition of 1A2. Um, this is kind of a unique thing that we haven't talked about previously, um, but this can actually cause tendonitis in uh there have been case reports where it's actually caused Achilles tendon rupture, especially in kids less than 18. Okay, this is one thing you want to kind of think about with with Levaquin and all the fluoroquinolones. It can cause tendonitis, and that Achilles tendon rupture is possible. Um, again, the mechanism is not very well delineated. We're not really sure why. Um, and this doesn't mean you can't use it in kids less than 18. It just means you want to be cautious. Or if they, you know, warn them, hey, listen, if you start to feel like a lot of ankle pain or start to notice any kind of like new pains in the joints maybe stop taking it, right? So um, that, that's something you would definitely educate on. We'll still use it in kids occasionally, um, but we'll try to use other things if possible because of this risk. Yeah. Okay. Um, next we have clindamycin. This one's going to have very particular coverage, whereas it's really good for gram positives, but it's also really good for anaerobes, okay? And so, again, this is where it gets a lot of utility here. Um, it does cover MRSA. So this is actually really good for things like skin infections, really good for things like osteomyelitis potentially. Um, actually, another really good thing it's uh, used for is for toxin media diseases. So if, uh, for instance, with like toxic shock syndrome, anyone ever heard of that? Basically something where uh, the, the case I always think of is like the, the female who uh, leaves the tampon in for too long and can develop this, uh, this uh, toxic shock syndrome where basically the bacteria are replicating and they're releasing all these exotoxins that can lead to uh, severe kind of uh, shock looking uh, symptoms, very hypotensive, tachycardic. And so one of the things you can actually use Kalinda for is actually it will bind up those toxins and actually help to, to limit that, that effect of shock, which is really kind of beneficial there. Um, you get a lot of uses sometimes for penicillin allergic patients, for surgical prophylaxis, it gets a lot of use here.
Note that you can use it in combination with other agents for an intra-abdominal infection. Why do you think I'd have to use it with something else for like an intra-abdominal infection? Yeah, it doesn't cover any gram negatives, right? So that's why you'd have to double cover that and you have uh, something to cover up that hole there. So either like a, a ceftriaxone or, or something else would be able to get in there and get those gram negatives, okay? Now, one thing to note with clindamycin um, is that this one is going to uh, be very notable for causing a lot of cases of C. diff. This one probably has the biggest risk associated with it, mainly because it covers those anaerobes. And again, Clostridium difficile is what? It's an anaerobe, right? So by clearing out the normal anaerobes that are growing in the gut, then C. diff can kind of come in and, and take its spot, okay? So the one thing to note with clindamycin. Okay, um, let's go ahead and do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then wrap up this section and then go on into derm. All right, you guys have any questions in the first half? So not, there's nothing on the sticky board, so you guys are just experts, I'm assuming. I'm just going to keep going with that assumption. They'll prove it otherwise, right? Terrible assumption. Terrible? I don't know about that. I've never run across a time in my life where making an assumption never had negative consequences, right? Anywho. All right, so getting back into the last couple of antibiotics here. Next, we have a combination drugs called sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, uh, frequently called Bactrim or Septra. There's common brand names for that. And so this is another pretty common outpatient antibiotic you might see being used for things like UTIs or skin and soft tissue infections. Basically, the way that these are going to be working is to try to inhibit folic acid utilization by the bacteria. Normally, folic acid is needed to produce things like new nucleotides to make new DNA. And so if we inhibit that process, we and stop the bacteria from making new DNA, and thus they eventually die off, right? Because if they can't make new DNA, they can't undergo mitosis. Eventually, apoptosis gets triggered off here, right? So basically, just know, and again, don't get too in the weeds in terms of which enzymes specifically are being inhibited. Just know that sulfamethoxazole is working on one part of the pathway, trimethoprim is working on the other, to try to prevent the folic acid from being utilized, Okay. There's actually, we can do the same thing for ourselves. We can actually, if we have cancerous cells, we can actually do the same thing with a drug called methotrexate uh, and basically stop our cells from using folic acid and kill those off as well, right? So um, again, very, you'll see parallel mechanisms here when we get into different disease states like uh, chemotherapy and whatnot. Anywho, um, in terms of coverage, fairly broad. You're going to find that Bactrim is going to help to cover things like MRSA, which is good, which is why it's good for skin and soft tissue infections. You know, a patient with an abscess or something, this could be used there. Um, not great for gut stuff necessarily in terms of the gram-positive coverage since enterococcus won't be covered here. However, um, you can see it being used for a broad spectrum of, of gram negatives, you know, things like your salmonella, your shigella. So, so in some cases, like infectious diarrhea could be potentially treated with, with Bactrim. Okay? The other thing you might see it used for is for prevention or treatment of a lot of opportunistic infections in patients who are immunocompromised. And so if you ever see, for instance, a patient who's on Bactrim every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or say uh, Saturday, Sunday, something like that, uh, very frequently it's going to be for prophylaxis for one of these opportuni opportunistic path pathogens, things like pneumocystis or toxoplasma, things like that. And so, um, for example, here, you know, PJP pneumonia or pneumocystic uh, Jarevecki pneumonia is something that you can see in patients either um, uh, with like neutropenia due to uh, treatment for leukemias, or if we have a patient with um, kind of more progressive HIV slash AIDS, you might see that. Um, but more often than not, you're going to see used for a lot of things like UTIs, uh, some cases for respiratory tract infections, and then as I mentioned, for GI infections, usually due to like infectious diarrheas and, and things like that. Um, it depends on the resistance patterns in terms of if it's going to get every single strain. I'd have to double check to see if there's any particular ones that it misses. But as far as I know, it should be able to get the majority of them as long as they're not resistant. Yeah. Um, anyway, so in terms of adverse effects to watch out for. So certainly hypersensitivity and rash can be a big one with, uh, with Septra. Um, certainly you want to be warning your patients about things like Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. And again, what was that? Have you mentioned that before? Yeah, basically it's a really severe skin reaction where you can start to see like blister, blisters in the mouth. They can start to see um, skin start to come off. Like that should be a very big warning sign. And again, fairly rare, but it can occur um, depending on, on the patient. You know, if they just have a predisposition for it. Um, however, note the blood dyscrasias here. Why do you think we see things like megaloblastic anemia in this kind of patient taking this drug? Because 
when you normally see patients with megoblastic anemias? Maybe they have a deficiency of folic acid, right? You guys will learn that in hematology. Um, this is actually a big cause for that. And so um, just like it suppresses the bacteria's ability to use folic acid, it can suppress our ability to use folic acid. And again, which cells in the body are most rapidly dividing a lot of times? Skin cells, hair cells. GI cells, also the bone marrow, right? So all of your, um, you know, things like your your platelet count your, can be affected. Your white count could be affected here. Your red blood uh, red blood cells can be affected as well, right? So those are things you want to think about. Okay. Um, in terms of drug interactions, this is a big thing to consider here. It's a big CYP2C9 inhibitor, so this is one that can really significantly increase warfarin levels, and so you got to be really careful with that interaction uh, and make sure you're, you're monitoring for that sort of thing there. Um, also, you can find that it can actually have effects with methotrexate, as I mentioned, with that drug, because um, it does kind of the same thing to our cells as Ceptra does to the bacterial cells. You can kind of see some synergy there, and you can develop things like pancytopenia due to decreased clearance of the drug. It can be really significant from that standpoint there, so just be aware of that. Uh, then we have flagyl or metronidazole. This one is good for covering uh, anaerobes and also some parasitic infections. So you may see this being used occasionally uh, for like vaginal infections and, and things like that uh, more topically. I uh, may see things uh, being used for uh, acne topically due to this anaerobic coverage here. Um, we use it a lot of times systemically for things like um, gut infections where we're combining it along with something else to cover, um, more like the gram negatives that could be present there. So very frequently, uh, if we'll have a patient coming in for appendicitis who's about to go to surgery, we might give them metronidazole, which gets the anaerobes in the gut, and then also like ceftriaxone to get a lot of the gram-negative uh, bugs that are growing there, right? Anywho, um, other thing, uh, notable coverage here is that this used to be the treatment of choice for C. diff in adult patients, but we have starting to see more and more resistance as antibiotics are being overused. More patients are getting um, treated with flagell. You're seeing more C. diff becoming resistant to that. Nowadays, we're, we're using more vancomycin as a first line of choice there. Um, but in kids, you know, metro, uh, metronidazole is still recommended first line for them. So um, you can note here, this one can be used either IV or PO. So that was a notable difference with vancomycin because what was the only route we could use for C. diff for that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah right. So that one, that's one big notable thing there. For, for severe C. diff infections, we might actually use IV metronidazole plus oral vancomycin to get kind of some synergy there. But um, this one could be used either IV or PO. Okay. Um, does anyone know what you do if you have, like, patients who have C. diff colitis and, like, even still, like, they just, uh, the drugs just aren't working and you can't get rid of it? Anyone know what like, the last line therapy is? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Ever heard of a fecal transplant? Yeah, you yeah, could actually use stool from people that live kind of in the same environment as them and actually transplant that into the patient, and that is hopefully going to like kind of restore the normal gut flora for them and get rid of the C. diff. So, again, if you ever thought your job was crappy, people have to do that for a living, right? Yes. Anywho, uh, another big notable side effect with metronidazole is what we call a disulfiram reaction. Disulfiram is an old drug uh, that the, the brand name for it is called Antabuse, and it was designed to help patients uh, who had an alcohol substance abuse issue um, basically stop taking alcohol, right? Stop drinking alcohol. What this drug does is it inhibits an enzyme called acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And so basically, when you drink alcohol, one of the ways it gets metabolized is through an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, and it gets turned into this product called acetaldehyde. And then from there, that then gets further broken down by the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. By inhibiting that second step of the process there, you build up levels of acetaldehyde, and it's not a very nice chemical. It causes a lot of flushing, and you get very hot, and you get sweaty, and you want to throw up, and it just you're miserable, right? So, And actually, some people actually have a natural lack of that enzyme. Anyone know who that might be? Certain ethnic backgrounds? Yeah, certain people of Asian descent actually lack the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase naturally. So if you ever hear like the Asian flush they, when they uh, are drinking, you can actually see that. There's a, there's a show, I think it's called Fresh Off the Boat. I saw a clip of it, but basically a guy was having to take medications along with his beers in order to make sure he didn't get that nasty flushing reaction there. But um, something you can see, and we can actually induce that with certain drugs. So disulfiram was one of them, but metronidazole is another one. So you can actually cause that very significant reaction. So don't tell, or at least tell your patients, hey, don't drink along with this drug. You could see that. I actually had one case where um, a pharmacy colleague of mine, his wife was taking a topical metronidazole for rosacea, and she actually, they were at the Olive Garden, and she got a glass of red wine, drank that, and forgot that she was using the, the metronidazole, and she got super, super flushed just on her face, and felt just hot and miserable, and they thought she was having a heart attack in the, in the restaurant and almost called 911. She's like, no, 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 it's just... Just this drug, but uh, again, be very careful with that. Do not drink along with it.
Anywho, again, even pharmacists can do very silly things. You know, so we're not always going to be the best people with drugs anyway, right? Anywho, um, right, so those are the big thing to think about with flagell. Okay, so any questions on that section? Yes, ma'am. Um, so all the cell wall active drugs are bactericidal, right? Um, most of the protein synthesis inhibitors are going to be bacteriostatic, except for like the immunoglycosides. But um, you know certain things like the adaptomycin was bactericidal, the fluoroquinolones are bactericidal because they're disrupting the DNA. Um, you know, Bactrim is going to be bactericidal. So yeah, there's certainly some other ones, right? So kind of think back to the mechanism, think about what it's actually doing to the cell, and that kind of will give you some clues in terms of like aminoglycosides are the one kind of notable exception to the rule in terms of protein synthesis inhibitors because those are bactericidal. So, any other questions? Okay, so that'll be it for the first quiz. In terms of material, so sections one and two, and then uh, up next we're going to talk about our derm stuff.